is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were take, talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make these three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around, and they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Please join me in our prayer for the preacher. This morning, Lord, we give thanks for having Wayne Shipley here to lead us in our service, help us to continue, continue to be able to worship together as a family, and we thank him for that, um, and please follow him uh, through all of his days and to the work that he does uh, with other churches. And we also ask for prayers, continued prayers, for Pastor Terry as she continues to focus on her health, gets test results back, and makes decisions about uh, what's best for her health and moving forward. And we pray all of that in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this morning. Linda, where'd Linda go? God bless you. I was talking to Terry, and I said, this reading with Elijah and Elisha is a tongue twister, right? So, and I, and I was a little bit worried about it, and Terry said, well, Linda will do the reading. I was like, oh, okay, thank you. So thank you for that this morning. So um, I, I'm really glad and excited to be here today. Uh, uh, Terry and I uh, have been friends a very long time. We were both uh, students at Towson was Towson State, then Towson State University, Towson State College, Towson State University, then Towson University, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, we both met in the media department there. We both uh, were studying film uh, there back in the day. Uh, I've known her since then, and uh, the, one of the very first things I did that was kind of like an adult ministry kind of thing was that Terry uh, enlisted me to help uh, help with a video or a film back in those days that her, she, was, she was working with the youth group at the original Epworth and asked me to help make a movie with her, with those kids. Uh, so that, that's, I've had a long association with both this community going back a good while. Um, you might think it's a little bit odd that uh, Terry invited someone from the Catholic Church to preach here today. Um, but as I was telling uh, some folks at the uh, earlier service today, I've actually been a Methodist longer than I've been a Catholic. I actually grew up in the Methodist Church. Uh, the first 40 years of my life, I, I was Methodist. Uh, Terry and I have a joke between us that we often share that, that she's the most Catholic Methodist and I'm the most Methodist Catholic. So we, we kind of meet somewhere there in between. Um, and I, and I loved growing up in the Methodist Church. It was great. I, uh, I loved singing. That was a big deal for me. Uh, and uh, I loved uh, doing things like, especially growing up, Vacation Bible School was awesome. I just loved doing that so much. Um, and uh, just growing up in the church and being in a small church community, it was Union United Methodist Church, which is over here uh, in the Long Green Hides area. 
Beautiful little community, not a big community, but uh, very faithful. Um, but uh, like many teenagers, uh, when you get to those teen years, you start to be like, yeah, I don't think I want to go to church so much anymore. Uh, and, I, and I made that decision for myself. And there was a lot of reasons why I made it. I, that's a whole other story in and of itself. But I pulled away from the church, uh, from the institutional church. Um, I did not pull away from my faith, though. I, I stayed connected to my faith. I, I kept praying. I kept reading scripture. I was blessed uh, when I was at Towson. I, I happened into a group of people who were of different faiths uh, who just happened to find each other. Um, I, I really do believe the Holy Spirit was in that at that time. Um, and uh, it was a great time because we would get together when we can, hanging out in the student union or going to lunch. Um, and we would talk about our faith and we would share and things like that. And, you know, and, and, you know there was me as sort of a somewhat disgruntled Methodist and there were some Catholics and there were Baptists. There was one woman who was uh, Salvation Army Church, which I never really thought of as a church, but they had a church. Uh, there was one guy who was a Messianic Jew and we would just get, get together and talk. And that really did help me stay connected because I needed those connections. I needed to be with other people. I needed to have that fellowship with others. So, you know, when I kind of pulled away from church, it really wasn't a a, a, a rejection of my faith. It was a searching for me. Um, I eventually met someone who was Catholic and we married in the Catholic Church, but I didn't um, want to be Catholic. You know, it, it was just wasn't my thing. Went to church every week. I, we decided to bring our children up Catholic. Um, but over the years, um, I really did feel a pull to dive deeper into my faith, and I did eventually become Catholic. Um, during that time, uh, and, and what became my first ministry as an adult in the church, I did what was called Children's Liturgy of the Word, which was almost every week I was doing exactly what I did here with these young people, was just helping them break open the gospel in a way that would make sense to them, right? Does that make sense this morning? Yes? Sort of? Maybe? Maybe, sort of, yes. Uh, they're busy, so. <laughs> but... Um, but I loved it. I loved working with young people. And then a few years later, uh, my church was looking for a youth minister. And at that point in time, I was feeling a call to minister to youth. Um, and so uh, I thought about it. I prayed on it. And I applied for the job. And I was hired. Um, and I did youth ministry for a number of years. Uh, and then I eventually um, uh, became what's called a pastoral associate. And a pastoral associate uh, in the Catholic Church is someone who's kind of, we, we all say it falls under other duties as assigned. You do just about anything the pastor asks and everything else. So I did a lot of that, but I also uh, supervised staff and I uh, sort of uh, had oversight over all of our faith formation offerings to young people, to adults, to everything that we did. Uh, and then a few years ago, uh, I got an invitation and it, it wasn't something I was looking for, um, but someone came to me uh, to invite me, uh, and that was to this position that I'm now in. Uh, and the person came to me and they said, um, I really feel the Holy Spirit in this moment. I feel the Holy Spirit. And I see this in you, I see this giftedness in you, and I see the gifts that you have to share, and I think you're being called and called to this other thing. Uh, and then they invited me to take it to prayer and take it to discernment. And I did, and I talked to a lot of friends. Terry was one of them. Um, and uh, I said, uh, people who have better discernment skills than I have, it's not, it's not my gift. And, and I, I said, what do you think? And this is the thing. And, and everybody was very positive and affirming and all those things. Uh, so I took the position that I now have. And I absolutely love it. Um, it's, it's wonderful ministry. I work with, uh, as I've told a few people here earlier today, I think I work with 49 different churches um, throughout uh, the west side of Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, um, and it keeps me hopping. I work with pastors, um, and I'm very much someone who wants to see pastors succeed. And uh, part of what I do is helping them try to figure that out and what's the best path for them. One of the things I feel is so very important, and, and I think it's part of today's gospel, um, and um, it's what I try to communicate to the young people, is this piece about invita invitation, excuse me. 
how important that is and the power in it. You know, I look back on my life and I wouldn't be where I am right now if it wasn't for people along the path inviting me and inviting me to think about something different and deeper and in some ways stepping outside my comfort zone. And let me tell you, stepping outside my comfort zone is not a thing for me because uh, on Myers-Briggs, I am an introvert. Are there any introverts out there? Nobody's raising their hand, which I expect because introverts, the last thing they want to do is sit in a room of people and raise their hand, right? Um, I, was, I said at the earlier service when I got here, this is like an introvert's nightmare, walking into a room full of people that you mostly do not know and expected to talk to them. So, um, but for me, I can, do intro, I can do these things, but it just exhausts me. Later today, I'll, I'll probably have a nice nap before the party tonight. Um, but, you know, the thing about introverts is um, we panic when we get invited to things. Has anybody ever felt that panic when you get invited to something? No matter what it is. It's like even a party. I like to go to parties sometimes. But sometimes you get invited to a party and you're like, hmm. And the person's standing there waiting for an answer and you say, well, maybe. And in the introvert's mind, it's like, uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to that party. <laughs> and if you say something like, let me check my schedule, that's a definite no, right? Because you don't have to answer right away. And it's, if they never mention it again, you're, you're safe. So that idea of being invited is, is a struggle for me sometimes. The transfiguration wasn't just this spectacular moment of light and amazement. It was an invitation from Jesus. And taking Peter and John and James there, it was an invitation not just to this event, but to intimacy with Christ. It was an invitation to intimacy. And if we want to believe, as we should, that the transfiguration is happening here in this church, in Epworth Church, we should want other people to be here. We should want to invite other people to be here. Who needs to be here? We need to approach it. I see this in you. You need to be here. You need to think about this. When we come to church on Sunday, look around. Think about who's missing. We talk about it all the time. Is it youth? Young adults? Young families? Single parents? The widow? The divorced? The Hispanic community? The black community? The Indian community? The Asian community? The wounded? The brokenhearted? The disenfranchised? The marginalized? Who should be here? Who can you lift up? As disciples, who are we inviting to go up to the mountain with us? We often hear about Jesus going off by himself in Scripture. And Jesus could have gone off by himself to the mountain, but he invited three friends, Peter, James, and John. And it was a powerful experience. And as I said to the young people, Peter, James, and John, they wanted to stay. They wanted to put up tents. They wanted to live there, stay there, build a fire, revel in the moment, extend it as long as they could. They desperately wanted to stay in that moment. But like all mountaintop experiences that we may have throughout our lives, there comes a time when we have to leave and move on. But the question is, and it was the question for those three disciples, how will you continue to live out that experience? When you come down from the mountaintop, how will you continue to live that out? This is true of any powerful spiritual experience that we have. Does it just come with a nice memory that gradually fades over time? Or does that experience become a part of your being? that you continue to live out in your life of faith. As we know, the pandemic changed everything. It changed how we thought about our place in the world. People were living in fear, distrust, anger, frustration, depression. It amplified every problem we have, our economic problems, our social problems, political, spiritual. It severely impacted churches. Fewer people, drop off and stewardship, all those things. 
But it's time to embrace such a time as this. With pastors I work with, they talk about the pandemic and it changed everything and I don't know what to do. And the thing I say again and again is, what's the opportunity here? What's the possibility? Let's stop dwelling on what we've lost. Grief is just a horrible thing. And we need to be attentive to our grief. And we need to work through our grief. But we also have to find that path forward. We have to look for the opportunities we have. A few weeks ago, my friend Sam Tryon was here preaching. And he told a story about an amazing service ministry he was a part of that was run by just 10 people. And it reminded me of conversations I often have with pastors I work with and coach. And sometimes I'll go to a pastor, and especially if it's the first time, and we're introducing, we're talking about the ministry and stuff, and I'll look at them and I'll say, what do you need? What do you need from me? There's two things I can't give you. I can't give you money, and I can't give you people in the pews. What do you need? And more often than not, the pastors will say, and I hear this from staff people too, volunteers. We need volunteers. We just don't have enough volunteers. We've got all this work going on. We don't have enough volunteers. And I go to a lot of churches. I try to go to a different church every weekend. And I can't tell you how many times that I've been in a church and someone comes up for announcement time or whatever and they'll say something like, we need volunteers for our religious education program. We don't have enough volunteers. If we don't get some volunteers right now, like sign up today, well, we're just gonna have to shut the program down. So, you know, step up, volunteer. Is that an invitation? No. And I'm just like, I, I hear that and I just, uh. And part of the issue is this, and I do believe this. When we talk about volunteers, I think we're mislabeling people. It's not volunteers we wanna step up, it's disciples. And I tell pastors, you don't have a volunteer problem. You have a discipleship problem. Because if people are discipled, if they're really discipled, you'll have the volunteers you need. Because if they're really discipled, they invite others into the community. You'll have plenty of volunteers. Before the service today, uh, I had a conversation with one of the folks here about Nativity Church down the road here. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's one of the churches I work with. They were a dying community. They were losing people at a furious rate to Grace Church, which was nearby, because people wanted the, the flashy and the music and all those things. And Nativity Church had to completely rethink how they do things. And the, one of the big things, and everybody focuses on the music and all that kind of stuff and the dramatic and, and this, that, and the other thing, and, and that's all part of it. But the thing that they changed is how they invite how they welcome, how they make people, anyone who walks through those doors, automatically feel like they belong. It was all about invitation. It's one of the very few churches I have walked into and walked into a sanctuary to look for a pew and, and it's full. People actually stand up out of the seats they always sit in and say, come sit with me. I've very I've never had people do that. I've never walked in churches had people invite me into their pew that way. And we all know how many of you were sitting in the pew you always sit in. Uh-huh. Right. So, you know, it's like giving up your territory, right? But that's what they do really really well. I was telling someone uh, I was in a men's group this past fall. This is bad invitation, okay? I was in a men's group this fall, and it was okay. It was one of these groups that gets together every week at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, I'm a morning person. I'm usually up by 5, so that's okay. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So 6 o'clock in the morning, we'd go over to the church. We'd have fellowship for half an hour, simple breakfast, donuts, pastries, whatever. And then we'd watch a video for half an hour, and then we would have a half hour of small group talking. Well, first and foremost... I decided not to do it again. It was 13 weeks of that. They're doing another 13 weeks right now. And I decided over time that I wasn't going to do it. And part of the reason was 
the videos were the most depressing things I've ever seen. And getting up at, well, I already get up at five, but getting on the road to be at a thing at six o'clock to be depressed just wasn't my way of starting my day. There was that. So I decided I wasn't going to do it anymore. Great relationships with the men in the fellowship. Great relationships. They started up about four weeks ago. I have not received one call or email or text or anything saying, we miss you. Where are you? Nothing. And I formed relationships with these guys. So that's been interesting. I'm still waiting to see if that changes. Invitation. We have to be about it all the time. There's a, a church renewal organization I work with. It's called Divine Renovation. And one of the things they say is, do our people who come to church see themselves as guests or hosts? Do you see yourself as guests or hosts? A guest naturally expects to be waited upon and looked after. But a host, on the other hand, makes an effort to receive people and care for them. A host prepares and makes sacrifices, like giving up your seat. A host welcomes guests and puts them at ease. And most importantly, a host invites people to come to the celebration. Inviting people to come to the celebration. So I have two questions for you to think about. What are we inviting people to here? And how do we set them on fire? I don't mean literally on fire. How do we kindle that fire within, right? Every Sunday here should be a mountaintop experience. We need to understand our presence here as a time to revel in the experience. But it's also ascending. Ascending to go out into the world and proclaim the good news. Ascending to go out and extend love and mercy to our fellow people. Ascending to go and make disciples. We are called to be audacious, to step outside of ourselves, our bubbles, our comfort zones, and be audacious. Take a chance. Make the invitation. Do it with zeal. As Christians, we are called to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Let me say that again. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Sometimes we get too comfortable. And we need to be afflicted. If we're not, we're just running in place. We need to move forward and get out of our comfort zones. We also need to be joy. Not just joyful, which is great, but be joy. Share our joy. Share the joy of the Lord with others. Our joy is an invitation to others. When others see our joy, they will want that as well. A quote often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi is, preach the gospel every day and if necessary, use words. People will know our faith by our actions more than our words. Our joyful living in the world is the first initial invitation for anyone that may be seeking. We're coming into Lent this week. I saw this wonderful meme on Facebook, and it was uh, two people talking, and one said, what are you doing for Valentine's Day? And the other one said, going to church, getting dirt rubbed on my head, and told I'm going to die. <laughs> That's a great way to start Valentine's Day, but it is a, it's, it's Lent, okay? It's when we reflect back on our earthly life and what to make of it. So during Lent, I want you to think about this. Who are you embracing the command of Jesus? How are you embracing the command of Jesus to go and make disciples? And who are you inviting to join you on the mountaintop to be transformed by Jesus? Peter says to Jesus, it is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be here. This dwelling is indeed a special place where all are invited to come and commune with Jesus and one another. Each of you has the power of invitation. Be audacious. Be joy. I want to share a poem with you, because I love poetry, and a prayer. This sonnet is by poet and clergyman Malcolm Geet, and it's titled Transfiguration. 
For that one moment, in and out of time, on that one mountain where all moments meet, the daily veil that covers the sublime in darkling glass fell dazzled at his feet. There were no angels full of eyes and wings, just living glory full of truth and grace. The love that dances at the heart of things shone out upon us from a human face. And to that light, the light in us leaped up. We felt it quicken somewhere deep within. A sudden blaze of long extinguished hope trembled and tingled through the tender skin. Nor can this blackened sky, this darkened scar, eclipse that glimpse of how things really are. Jesus, Rabbi, divine source of light, guide us on the path of transformation where love and hope intertwine. May our hearts radiate compassion and joy. May we embrace the gift of this community, inviting others to join us on the mountain of faith, creating a tapestry woven with kindness and understanding. Amen.